I met Louisa in the shade, and having seen that lovely maid, why should I fear to say that nymph-like she is fleet and strong, and down the rocks can leap along like rivulets in May? And she hath smiles to earth unknown, smiles that with motion of their own do spread and sink and rise that come and go with endless play, and ever as they pass away are hidden in her eyes. She loves her fire, her cottage home, yet all the moorland will she roam in weather rough and bleak, and when against the wind she strains, oh, might I kiss the mountain rains that sparkle on her cheek. Take all that's mine beneath the moon, if I with her but half a noon, may sit beneath the walls of some old cave or mossy nook, when up she winds along the brook to hunt the waterfalls. little I can do, Mr. Wordsworth. Your sister is strong, but her strength works against her. Her recovery after these attacks has been progressively slower. This time she seems unable to restore herself. I'm afraid there's little hope. If it were not for your nursing, she would have gone long since. Oh, don't say that. No, please. If she were to depart, my life would be robbed of a light to a degree that I have not the courage to think of. This laudanum mixture is the only relief I can give her. Without the opium it contains, the pain will be unendurable. It will wear her out. I will see that she drinks it. William? Yes. Mm. I heard the rain fall and thickly. I was calling your name. I heard you. Your brother will sit by you, Miss Wordsworth. Rest and yet more rest is my prescription. But I'll see you tomorrow morning. Morning? Is it still? I leave you in the best possible hands. My wife will see you to the door, Doctor. Make sure she has plenty of hot broth. Now, you must drink some of this, I insist. Don't fret, William. Don't fret. Just talk to me. Read me some of your poetry, that's the best tonic. You must have heard every line a thousand times. You wrote them all down. You must know them far better than I. I've been remembering so many different things in our lives, jumbling them all up together. They all became a single dream, all bound together by your poetry. Whether I was just... Louisa, Emma, Emmeline, or just Lucy. You've put all my life into your poetry. You have put your life into the poetry. It's ours, not mine. Ever since we were children chasing butterflies. And bird nesting. Oh, how miserable I'd have been after Mother died if it hadn't been for you. I don't remember us bird nesting, Dorothy, but I do remember you taking don't me. Don't call up. me Dorothy. Dorothy is a name used for strangers and forgetting your own poetry. Behold. No, I was beneath, teasing. Behold the. Emmy. Behold beneath the leafy shade. Emmy, of course I remember the, the sparrow's bright nest. The blue eggs together laid. Oh, me, the chance discovered. Gleamed like a vision of delight. I started seeming to espy the home and sheltered bed 
The sparrow's dwelling, which hard by my father's house, in wet or dry, my sister, Emmeline and I, together visited. She looked at it and seemed to fear it, dreading or wishing to be near it. Such heart was in her being then, a little prattler among men. The blessing of my later years was with me when a boy. She gave me eyes, she gave me ears, and humble cares and delicate fears. A heart, the fountain of sweet tears, and love, and hope, and joy. The power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Uncle, why could my sister Dorothy not be here, sir? Don't be mawkish, boy. She's been sent away to a good home in Halifax. She's a fortunate girl. She ought to thank her maker. Will I see her again, sir? Why do you ask? Why should you? You're willful and too full of sentiment. Your parents were too soft with a pair of you. But now they're in their grave, I'm packing you off to Hawkshead. You need schooling, boy. Forget your sister. Put her out of your mind. I was so lonely away from you in that house. Cold as a convent, and you running the hills like a savage. How I envied you. Hmm. Savages don't spend their days in schoolrooms with raw knuckles and sore eyes. Neither do they have holidays, I suppose, and roam about in tribes. Ah. We were a noisy crew. The sun in heaven beheld not veils more beautiful than ours, nor saw a band in happiness and joy richer or worthier of the ground they trod. I could record with no reluctant voice the woods of autumn and their hazel bowers with milk-white clusters hung. The rod and lime, true symbol of hope's foolishness, whose strong and unreproved enchantment led us on, by rocks and pools, shut out from every star all the green summer to forlorn cascades among the windings of the mountain brooks, unfading recollections. Fair seed time had my soul, and I grew up fostered alike by beauty and by fear. Oh, at that time, while on the perilous ridge I hung alone, with what strange utterance did the loud, dry wind blow through my ear? The sky seemed not a sky of earth, and with what motion moved the clouds. Thus, while the days flew by and years passed on, from nature and her overflowing soul, I had received so much that all my thoughts were steeped in feeling. I was only then contented when, with bliss ineffable, I felt the sentiment of being spread, or all that moves, and all that seemeth still, or all that leaps, and runs, and shouts, and sings, or beats the gladsome air, or all that glides beneath the wave, yea, in the wave itself, in mighty depths of waters. Wonder not if such my transports were, for in all things I saw one life, and felt that it was joy. could live here forever, couldn't you? You are a home bird, aren't you? Everywhere you look, you see domestic bliss for both of us. Anyway, the legacy that was left to us wouldn't feed a mouse, never mind you and me. I can manage on very little. I can wash and iron and cook and bake and scrub and clean, and I could transcribe all your work. Yes, well, I did manage to live on nothing at Cambridge. We'll find a little cottage with a stream and a tidy patch of ground to grow our own vegetables. When I come back from France. Oh, William, we've been parted for so long, and 
We've been together so little. You sure you have to go, William? Why not accept Uncle's offer and become a vicar? I'm going to be a poet. But you could become a vicar and a poet. You could combine the two vocations. If I became a vicar, it would only be a way of supporting us. I'd rather teach, take pupils. And pupils have to be taught languages. Well, then take me with you to France. A country in a state of revolution is no place for a woman. Isn't it, brother? No, sister. It's far too dangerous. <laughs> You're only good for the excitement of it, aren't you? The adventure. Look. The old order must be pulled down. We must follow France. And then this place will be fit for poets. France is showing us the way. You will take care, though. Won't you, William? Yes, of course. I'll wait for you. Of our child, will you? Oh no, I shall love it. Et tout, ma chère. I think we should go to England. I'm down to my last few francs. Have you money there to support us? My uncle wants to see me ordained. I've been thinking you about it. You are a priest. Well, I shall receive a handsome <laughs> stipend and we'll have a roof over our heads into the bargain. Roof? Or what sort of roof? Well, a vicarage roof, of course. And what will your parishioners make of your Catholic wife? I shall remain here and teach English. To your jailers, our country is on the brink of war. And I will neither to be the wife of a teacher or a churchman. I will be the wife of a famous poet, or not marry at all. You must go back to England alone, William. And my parents are wealthy, and I shall return to them. I shall want for nothing, except you. You must go back to France. How? Tell me. Before I left, it was easy to travel, but the two countries are at war now, Lucy. You don't seem to understand the difference, have you? I understand a woman with your child waiting for you. Think of them. Of course you must go back. Even if I evaded the blockade, what have I to offer? I have no skill, save poetry, and no one's interested in that. Look at the contempt the first collection received. Only from closed minds. I know your work. You Just... are, alas, not the public or the critics. I've no profession, I've no money, I've no expectation of money. What would I bring? Love. Would 
you all get down, please, ladies and gentlemen? She's stuck fast. Right, push on, everybody. Get you back to that escape wheel. your duty, William. I'm not escaping it. Where does my duty lie? How about you? What about our plans? I should not say that. That is unfair. Our life ahead, brother and sister together, poetry, frugality, like minds, close and shared interests. How could I find that without you? You must not tempt me with that. Nor must you make your own path easy. You have to go back to France, William, you must. Oh, France is in chaos. Where would I look? Well, you must try. But if I should not succeed, shall I return to you? Neither of us must think of that. that you love her. We must pray for poor Annette and hope that the war will soon be over. Why is everything confusion? Why must they execute so many? Surely it destroys all they believe in. The revolution has gone mad. How can they use that guillotine? How will Annette and the child live through such terror? It'll all turn out for the best in the end. The important thing now is you to keep up your strength. You must eat, William, and you must start writing again. Oh, nobody wants the poems. The critics scorn them or ignore them. I hate publishing them. I'm afraid to write them. What are they worth? They are worth fighting for, William. Oh, Lucy. Oh, yes. I confess that of all men, I'm most partial to William. He never tires of comforting his sister. He never leaves her in anger. He always meets her with joy. He prefers her society to every other pleasure. I, I have written all his poems out in a fair hand. She seems peaceful. Laudanum, weakness, and her own tender concern that we should not be troubled. I believe she's more concerned about my headaches than she is about her own terrible pains. Dr. Carr cannot hide it. He thinks that she will be going from us this time. Now, don't worry. She's always got better before. Mary, please. Um, 
make me up a bed for me beside her. She may need... She may, she may need watching over during the night. Mr. Wordsworth. I was told you were good enough to entertain a curious visitor for a few moments. Uh, if I intrude on your privacy, please say so, and I shall take my leave. Oh, no, no, I'm in the need of conversation. If you're in the mood for a stroll, I'm not expecting a glorious sunset. Oh, I've seen so many fine sights in this district that nothing will give me occasion for complaint. How do you like our country, sir? Oh, I like it very well. And it is indeed your country, if I may be so bold. Mr. Wordsworth, permit me. It was your work which inspired me to come here. Indeed. If you were not a man of the cloth, I might suspect you of flattery, Reverend Dewey. Mr. Wordsworth, I love the poems, but I respect the poet. You must surely be aware, sir, that an edition of 20,000 of your poems was struck off in the town of Boston this year. Oh, so they say. I'll give you another figure to consider. In this entire county of Cumberland, not a single copy of my poems has been sold. Not one. Those few in private hands are either bought in London or given by me. What do you say to that? A prophet is not without honor, sir. Oh, you're not a missionary, are you? Rest assured, sir, I'm taking a sabbatical. Traveling Europe, seeing the sights. Ah. I traveled across Europe once, on foot. I was a tourist, too. That time has passed. And all its aching joys are now no more. And all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint eye, nor mourn, nor murmur. Other gifts have followed. For such loss, I would believe abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still, sad music of humanity, nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, and rolls through all things. Amen. You're something of a missionary yourself, sir. on high or vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. Beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, and to think these are the very shores that inspired those immortal lines and brought joy to so many people, my humble self included, sir. Mm. You have my eyes and ears to thank for that, Reverend Dewey. Oh, I would consider myself fortunate if I were blessed with perception a hundredth part as sensitive, Mr. Wordsworth. And my heart. I happen to have the journal with me. 
There's an entry here written some time ago which might interest you if I can find it. <clears throat> oh, yes. <clears throat> when we were in the woods beyond Gobra Park, we saw a few daffodils close to the waterside. We fancied that the lake had floated the seeds ashore and that the little colony had so sprung up. But as we went along, there were more and yet more. And at last, under the boughs of the trees, we saw that there was a long belt of them along the shore about the breadth of a country turnpike road. I never saw daffodils so beautiful. They grew among the mossy stones about and about them. Some rested their heads upon these stones as on a pillow for weariness, and the rest tossed and reeled and danced and seemed as if they verily laughed with the wind that blew upon them over the lake. They looked so gay, ever glancing, ever changing. Thank you. That was a rare privilege. An artist's sketches are often as exciting as the finished work. Your stamp is unmistakable. That reverend was written by my sister. William had slept badly. He got up at nine o'clock, but before he rose, he had finished the beggar boys. And while we were at breakfast, that is, for I had breakfasted, he, with his basin of broth before him untouched and a little plate of bread and butter, he wrote the poem to a butterfly. The thought first came upon him as we were talking about the pleasure we both always feel at the sight of a butterfly. I told him that I used to chase them a little, but that I was afraid of brushing the dust off their wings and did not catch them. Pleasant, pleasant were the days, the time when, in our childish plays, my sister, Emmeline, and I together chased the butterfly. A very hunter did I rush upon the prey. With leaps and springs, I followed on from brake to bush, but she, God love her, feared to brush the dust from off its wings. I'll not bake for you at all. You've left all that bread and butter. Well, I'll have it with my tea. It'll be stale by then. And fly blown. Then I'll write you another poem, The Bread and Butterfly. William, I must get on with my work. Leave it. Come, my sister, come, I pray. With speed, put on your woodland dress and, and bring, bring no, no book. book. For this one day, we'll give to idleness. <laughs> You think all you have to do is to say these few lines of poetry to me and I'll stop whatever I'm doing and I'll follow you to the ends of the earth.
On the way home, we went to John's Grove. William lay, and I lay in the trench under the fence. He with his eyes shut, and listening to the waterfalls and the birds. There was no one waterfall above another. It was the sound of waters in the air, the voice of the air. William heard me breathing and rustling now and then, but we both lay still and unseen by one another. He thought that it would be as sweet thus to lie so in the grave, to hear the peaceful sounds of the earth. William! William, you killed her! What do you mean? You shouldn't have seen this. William, you killed our love! What are you talking about? I'd never do that. She lived unknown, and few could know when Lucy ceased to be. But she is in her grave, and all the difference to me. You've buried our love, William. There's no denying no, no, it's just a poem. It's a poor scrap of a thing. I'm just working at it. It's not finished yet. It's not meant to be read. Well, I found it. I thought you'd want me to transcribe it. It's not worth a quarrel. There is no quarrel. But I am Lucy. I know that. Haven't I? Now, why do you torment yourself? Because you have killed her. I think we have been alone too long. <laughs> Isolation can encourage morbid thoughts. <laughs> and we must travel more, visit old friends. Well, the Hutchinsons have always been asking... They always said to... you'd marry Mary Hutchinson. Well, you wanted me to marry Annette. Well, now the war's over, you've no excuse not to... I'll be, be total strangers. I will never marry. You are all I need to love. I think you should marry. I fear for us both if you do not. Fear? Why fear? Why are you so determined to hurt yourself? Because of the love I have for you, William, and because you wish to bury it. It's only a poem. Why can't you accept it? Your poems tell me the truth. They show me what is in your soul. They tell me what is right. No, 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 please. You must never, never, ever say that, my darling sister. Please never, never say oh, that again. Now. It's not oh, so. Gosh, now. Oh, gosh. Don't distress yourself. She's not real. I will live. Farewell, thou little nook of mountain ground, thou rocky corner in the lowest stair of that magnificent temple which doth bound one side of our whole vale with grandeur rare. Sweet garden orchard, eminently fair, the loveliest spot that man hath ever found. Farewell, we leave thee to heaven's peaceful care, thee and the cottage which thou dost surround. The flowering shrubs that deck our humble door will prosper, though untended and alone. Fields, goods, and far-off chattels we have none. These narrow bounds contain our private store of things earth makes and sun doth shine upon. Here are they in our sight. We have no more. Dear spot, which we have watched with tender heed, bringing thee chosen plants and blossoms blown among the distant mountains, flower and weed, which thou hast taken to thee as thy own, making all kindness registered and known. Thou, for our sakes, though nature's child indeed, fair in thyself and beautiful alone, hast taken gifts which thou dost little need. We go for one to whom ye will be dear, and she will prize this bower, this Indian shed, our own contrivance, building without peer. A gentle maid, whose heart is lowly bred, whose pleasures are in wild fields gathered, 
with joyousness and with a thoughtful cheer will come to you, to you herself will wed and love the blessed life that we lead here. O oh, happy garden, whose seclusion deep hath been so friendly to industrious hours and to soft slumbers that did gently steep our spirits, carrying with them dreams of flowers and wild notes warbled among leafy bowers. Two burning months let summer overleap, and coming back with her who will be ours, into thy bosom we again shall creep. flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. Listen, the mighty being is awake and doth with his eternal motion make a sound like thunder everlastingly. Dear child, dear girl that walkest with me here, if thou appear untouched by solemn thought, thy nature is not therefore less divine. was a phantom of delight. She was a phantom of delight when first she gleamed upon my sight. A lovely apparition sent to be a moment's ornament. Her eyes as stars of twilight fair, like twilight's too, her dusky hair, but all things else about her drawn from Maytime and the cheerful dawn, a dancing shape, an image gay, to haunt, to startle, and waylay. I saw her upon nearer view, a spirit, yet a woman too, her household motions light and free, and steps of virgin liberty, a countenance in which did meet sweet records, promises as sweet, a creature not too bright or good, for human nature's daily food, for transient sorrows, simple wiles, praise, blame, love, kisses, tears, and smiles. Well, Mary, did you like that? Oh, you should publish that one, William. You oh, really should publish it. That was the nicest wedding oh, present a girl could wish for. Yeah. Even if it was a day early. He's fair champing at the bit, he is. I hope it's all that's <laughs> premature. <laughs> hey, what? <laughs> it's nice for a girl to have a declaration on an nuptial. Oh, isn't that pretty? Forget me nots. All around the border. I must thank Dolly for that. That's her handiwork. Oh, Dolly, you're sweet. It was sweet. Dolly, I'm so happy we're soon to be sisters. Yeah. The toast. Oh. Happy couple. The happy couple. To a happy couple. <laughs> oh, 
Hey, don't they make a lovely couple, Dolly? It's your turn next, Dolly. Bye, Bye. Bye. Dolly. You'll never yeah. marry. <laughs> You think I'm going to die, but I'm not. I can't die. I'm dead already. Oh, God bless us, my poor dear. What are you saying? I had a ring like that once. Dolly. I seem to have lost it. You haven't seen it, have you? It was Mother's ring. I was married once, you know. What's this? You must dress, dearest. You can't be late for your own brother's wedding. I can't go, William. But you're the bridesmaid. What would Mary think? I'm sorry. You must be strong now, my darling. It will soon be over. In an hour, I will be married, and you and Mary and me will go back to Duff Cottage. It's too hard, William. I, I thought I could be strong, but I can't. It's too hard. Don't, please, don't. Love, please, it will make no difference to us. We will still live together. We'll, we'll never be alone again. We'll never have those evenings. And the, the walks and the rambles. And the journey's just you and me together. If I thought that, then indeed I would not marry. But you shall see. It will be the same as before, except... Mary will be there! Would you like her? You never had a sister. You've always told me how much you like her. Oh, yes, it was easy for you to believe what I said. But what I felt, you did not listen to that. You heard it, but you did not listen. Don't turn away, William. You know I'm speaking the truth. Why did you kill me? Oh, you're not still thinking about that wretched Lucy poem, are you? It's true. You buried a letter to the child, and now you're disposing of me. Dorothy, please! Oh, don't call me Dorothy! Dorothy's for every day. Dorothy is for strangers. Oh, William, I'm sorry. Here, take our mother's ring and fasten it on her finger with my blessing. Bless you, dear sister. Thank you. Bless you.
I trust you will not mistake my concern for impertinence, sir, if I suggest you return to your home. The air is turning chill and your wife must be expecting you. Though it surely is a most dramatic prospect. There was a time when meadow, grove and stream, the earth and every common sight to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of your turn, wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen, I now can see no more. What way does the wind come? What way does he go? He rides over the water and over the snow, through wood and through vale, and o'er a rocky height which the goat cannot climb takes his sounding flight. He tosses about in every bare tree, as if you look up you plainly may see. But how he will come, and whither he goes, there's never a scholar in England knows. Hark! Over the rooftop. He makes a pause and growls as if he would fix his claws right in the slates and with a huge rattle he drives them down like men in a battle. But let him rage round. He does us no harm. We'll build up the fire where snug and warm. Untouched by his breath, see the candle shines bright and burns with a clear and a steady light. Books have we read. That half-stifled knell, at last is the sound of the eight o'clock bell. Come now, we'll to bed, and when we are there, he may work his own will, and what will we care? He may knock at the door, we'll not let him in. He may drive at the windows, we'll laugh at his din. Let him seek his own home, wherever it be. Here's a cosy, warm house for Johnny and me. Time for bed, son. But I haven't finished up my milk. Then you can finish it up upstairs. Come on now, say good night. Good night, night. Night, night, darling. Sleep well. And John, will you say thank you to your Auntie Dolly for writing you that nice poem? Right, Mother. Thank you for the nice poem, Aunt Dolly. And Mum will be making me up another one. I'll leave that to your father. Well, I think I'll say good night as well. Good night, Dolly. You used to live here, did you not? Yes, when I could afford nothing else. Mr. Wordsworth, is there any comfort I can bring to assist you out of these shadows? I think not, Reverend Dewey. Then take heed of your own words. Words that brought me 3,000 miles. Words you seem to have forgotten. Our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting. The soul that rises with us, our life star, hath had elsewhere its setting and cometh from afar. Not in entire forgetfulness and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Then come, my sister, come, I pray. With speed, put on your woodland dress and bring no book for this one day. We'll give to idleness.
She gave me eyes. She gave me ears. And humble cares. And delicate fears. A heart, the fountain of sweet tears. And love, and hope, and joy. <laughs>